Hello, everybody. Welcome into a Friday edition of the Computer America Show. It's Tech 50 Plus. Uh, Gary Kay is here with us for both hours. It's going to be a really interesting show. Uh, we also have our social media winner of the week. It's all coming up here on the Computer America Show. Uh, it is basically it's the weekend is upon us, and it's the long weekend. We got the Fourth of July holiday coming. A Monday will be a best of Computer America. Uh, we won't have a live show, but uh, then we'll come back uh, on Tuesday. So anyhow, it's sit back and relax as we bring to you two hours of Computer America coming at you right here. Gary, right, why don't you put yourself on mute? Your show will go live in five seconds. Four, three, two, one. Broadcasting live, it's America's longest-running national radio talk show on computers, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. Look for Craig's weekly column in your favorite newspaper. This show is being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. Keep it here for technology news, computer products, guest interviews, and your phone calls. You're listening to Computer America. Hello, and welcome into the Computer America show. It's the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show about computers and technology. Computer America is heard around the world and coast to coast. And I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. <laughs> there you go. And it's Friday. <laughs> Friday's a good day. Yes, it is. All right. And uh, uh, we're all set up and ready to go here. I, I got. I got to tell you, it's a... Uh, it's been a very interesting week, and uh, we are here at the end of it. Uh, we we made it once again. And uh, Ben, oh my gosh, what happened to June? It's July. <laughs> yeah, I was uh, I was fully expecting that one, and I feel like you only continue that trend because you know I'm expecting it, so therefore you need to say it. So, um, <laughs> but hey, no, July first, that's good. Middle of summer, so yeah. you know the. The, the, the closer we get to the middle of summer, the closer we get to the end of summer, because summer is no fun, as I'm sure many, many people around the country, and, uh, well, I can't say around the world, because obviously seasons, but uh, at least here in the U.S., I think people are already over of summer. They were over summer from the first week, and those heat waves came through. Yeah, so. it, uh, and the heat waves and, and fires and, you know, just the, some places that just not enjoying the summertime. Uh, where you are, though, actually, I understand it's quite nice. It's quite oh. lovely. Wow. Quite lovely. Good, yeah. good enough for a hike and all that good nonsense and, you know, whatever mm -hmm. do that are computer related. Um, you know, I hear people enjoy outdoors. I've never seen it, but, you know, uh, it being the outdoors. But, um, <laughs> Greg, what are you yeah. doing for 4th of July? Um, we are probably going to, you know, make hot dogs and hamburgers, just do a cookout. And, uh, it should be. Oh, yes. Feast, Feast for America. That's good. I like that. Yeah, we got the hot dogs and hamburgers planned and everything, and the, the, the local area has fireworks here. So, And fortunately, uh, our dogs are not here. They're with you, so they won't be freaking out with the uh, fireworks explosion. Well, no, they won't be freaking out around you. They'll be freaking out around <laughs> right. me. So yeah, exactly. I'm sure a lot of people are already preparing their dogs, you know, getting them uh, Dramamine. You know, <laughs> whatever, whatever it is, I don't know if you drug your dogs or if you like. just, you know... <laughs> lock them in the bathroom, but uh, yeah, firework season not the best dog season. Especially if your dog is kind of high strung, like Jasmine. You know, she's you, know, you go boom. Can't get bad. No, you can't. So, what are you doing for the Fourth of July? I understand your your the neighbors have invited you over for for fun and festivities. Yep, neighbors, food, good good company. You know, the the usual. What watch things explode? It's um, <laughs> it it's going to be a good America. So yeah, a good America day. Good, excellent. Well, uh, we wish you all the uh, happiest of the Fourth of July uh, uh, holiday that's upon us. Uh, uh, ben and I, uh, we'll be off the air. C come Monday, we're going to have a best of show. We won't have a live show. Aww. Yeah, but uh, that's okay. And then on Tuesday, we'll be back live here to uh, on Computer America. Yay! <laughs> so, uh, uh, just be forewarned. Just let you know we'll. Uh, We'll select a, a really good show from the past that you can enjoy and listen to. We'll have that all up at ComputerAmerica.com. In the meantime, uh, today we're we're going to uh, have one of our 
uh, correspondent joining us for both hours. Uh, we'll get to him in a little bit. Uh, his name is Gary Kay. He is the co-founder and creator of a website called Tech50+. Plus. Uh, he's the founder and chief content officer for the website, and uh, we love having Gary on. He's here with us on a monthly basis. We're trying to get him to come on the same day, but, you know, things uh, vary, uh, and he's on with us today. We'll, we'll, hopefully, we'll be able to nail him down to come on the program on, on the same day. It just makes things more easy that way. In the meantime, if you have a comment or question for Ben or myself or for Gary, give us a call at 347-884-8881. That's 347-884-8881. That number will get you on, and it will get you through. Um, if you don't want to call us, but you still have a comment or a question or suggestion, head over to ComputerAmerica.com, uh, and on any page there, uh, any page, on the upper right-hand corner, it says Submit a Question. Just click it, because it's a link, and it'll take you to a question submission page. You can type in anything you like. You hit the Submit button, and Ben and I will see what you typed immediately. So that's a great way to get in touch with us that way. Um, if you're radio shy and don't like to uh, make a phone call. The other thing that we always invite you to do, and it'll be very uh, effective today, uh, is our live video stream. Uh, head over, to, again, to ComputerAmerica.com on any page of the, uh, the menu bar there. It'll say Show Lounge. If you click that, it'll take, it'll take you immediately to our live video streaming page. You'll join the show already in progress, and uh, you can not only listen to the show there, but you can watch the show there. Uh, and you can still be able to see Gary. You'll be able to see Ben. Uh, ben also has the technology to display websites, videos, movies, links, that type of thing. So it'll actually enrich your experience. You can actually see a lot of what we're talking about on today. So we invite you to join our live video stream. Of course, give us a call, 347-884-8881. That's the, the best way to get an easiest, quickest way to get in touch with us. All right, so uh, anything else you want to... Oh, of course, we're going to have our social media winner of the week. We're going to be giving away that Logitech M535 Bluetooth wireless mouse to some lucky uh, person who uh, registered for a contest. And again, if you haven't registered for a contest, just head over to ComputerAmerica.com. Uh, on our Interact, uh, you'll see how to enter in the contest. It's very simple. You only have to do it once, and uh, you can get up to five entries every single week just by doing the one thing that, uh, that it tells you to do. So it's really simple. And uh, as I said, we're going to be awarding that prize later on today. All right, so uh, anything else you want to uh, mention, Ben, before we uh, bring Gary on to the program? Uh, no, you covered a lot there, and you know, just, just want to make it perfectly clear that if you try to tune in Monday, you will get a best of. It will not be live, so don't try to call in, because yeah. no one will be there to answer your call. <laughs> um, other than that, no, you know, of course, stick around for the prize, like Craig said. And I think we've solved long enough. All right. Well, Tech 50 Plus, uh, as I mentioned, is an online magazine with the motto, Technology with a Boomer Perspective. Okay. It's written by Gary Kay, who himself is an award-winning journalist who has been covering tech since 1981. Uh, after a career with major networks, he now writes about tech for the 50-plus market. Uh, Gary is Tech 50 Plus's founder and chief content officer, and he is now one of Computer America's stable of technology correspondents who appears here on a regular monthly basis. Uh, Gary brings his insights into how pif people 50 and over are embracing and using computers and technology. Gary, welcome to Computer America. How are you? Hang in here, Craig. Hang in. I, now, I understand we should have a little bit of a warning. Uh, it, the weather is not what we call the best of weather, and you said there's a possibility that you might lose electricity at any moment? Yeah, we're under a, uh, a thunderstorm uh, warning, and actually there's some areas uh, not far from us that are under a tornado warning. Ah. Um, so, and we live out in the boonies where uh, all you have to do is blink and the power goes off. So uh, with a little luck, uh, Connecticut Light and Power will be gracious to us, uh, and, and if not, you'll hear a lot of dead air. And you don't have to do any blinking, too. Just keep your eyes open. <laughs> that maybe help, too, you know? Okay. So uh, I, I'm, I'm going to be spending the 4th of July um, up at uh, the lawn at uh, Tanglewood up in Lenox, Massachusetts, listening to uh, James Taylor. Oh, nice. Something oh, okay. that my family and I do just about every single year, going back for about 20-some-odd years now. It's nice to have traditions like that. You know? Uh, yes, it is. It is. It's just, uh, James Taylor. 
Okay. Um, well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Gary and I and Ben kind of confer, you know, to talk about the selecting topics that uh, we're going to be hearing. And uh, I think the first topic we're going to be talking about today is kind of actually when you first suggested it, what had happened in the news hadn't happened yet. And so I think it makes it even more relevant. The question was could driving one day be illegal? Uh, and we're going to be referring to the self driving car. But as you know, Gary, um, a what they're calling the very first accident fatal accident fatal accident with a self-driving car specifically a Tesla just happened this 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 past this week uh, so why don't we kind of factor that in too and 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 you pick it up from there well you know the industry knew that sooner or later there were going to be fatalities from from self-driving cars um, the question was, you know, when was it going to happen and, and how was it going to take place? And the preliminary report that I've seen indicates that the cameras on the Tesla were unable to distinguish between the light color of a truck and the, the color of the sky. And that's, that's a problem. Um, and uh, that's, that's what basically was the, the proximate cause of, of the accident. So the tr the, tr the truck was like a pale blue or something. Well, it was, it was, I think it was like a, a whitish, and and the sky was very bright, and apparently the cameras uh, couldn't tell the difference. Uh, it, Are you it, talking it, about this uh, th this Tesla in Utah? No, this was I believe in Ohio. Ohio, uh, you know, because uh, the the only story I had heard about this was uh, you know there was a Tesla that. Well, maybe maybe this was it. I don't know where where was the guy from. I thought he was from Ohio, but the, the, um, he he might have been. But uh, the story was uh, it says local te uh, local Tesla. Da, da, da. I've it was either Ohio or Utah. I'm, they're the same state. Let's get this <laughs> um, But yeah, right. Like even this picture that that you know that kind of went viral. I remember seeing this photo. You can see the the pale blue. Uh, you know, kind of. Uh, struts or whatever you know this truck is made out of uh, is actually you know very very light blue like a sky would be. So I, I think that you know there are a couple of questions here. The first of of which of course is whether the technology is ready for prime time, and there are a variety of different technologies that are being employed to make the self-driving car uh, workable. Uh, cameras and uh, machine vision and so on is is only one of them. Um, lidar, um, you know, a form of uh, I guess radar or um, you know in infrared and radar, all sorts of high tech stuff with spinning wheels on the top of the car mm -hmm. uh, is another method that uh, that I believe Google has been using. Um, probably no. not not quite as pretty, but maybe sli slightly more effective. Well, now this was an accident that, that how many hundreds of thousands or, or, or of miles that, that these driverless cars have been driving without any, you know, uh, I mean, this comes, this is, this is far more impressive than, you know, all the lives that are lost on a daily basis for people driving cars. Well, I mean, that's, that's really the evaluations that you've got to do. I had a chance to listen to... Uh, the Secretary of Transportation, Anthony Fox, a couple of weeks ago talking about uh, the inevitability of the self-driving car. And the numbers are very persuasive. Ninety-two percent of all accidents uh, are the result of human error. Wow. And, yeah. So, uh, and, you know, we're talking about, what, about 30,000 highway deaths a year. And they, they say that that could be reduced uh, dramatically if self-driving cars were, were to become prevalent. So, you know, you know that you knew sooner or later there was going to be a fatality with a self-driving car. Whether it was going to be this year or five years from now, it was going to happen. It had to happen. Um, the question is, do you, does that mean you stop the development of self-driving cars or does it mean uh, that you try and just make the technology better? Right. Well, um, well, that's what happens. I mean, we, we, you, now we, we see a particular scenario or situation that could not be anticipated, let's say, in the labs and what have you. And, and when you put something out into the world, into the real world, then you, then you find out where, where things are lacking. So here's an example. Okay, the, the color of the truck was sort of like the sky, and so they're going, they need to re recode the, the system. So when something like that happens, that, that, that 
you won't have this kind of a, a situation again. Precisely. Uh, so I mean, but you're you're quite right. I mean, you could repeat the same kind of uh, testing that you do on, on a closed test track, which is what, what they do in Michigan, and or or in a, a closed, essentially a, a small neighborhood, which is what Google does in in the Bay Area, mm -hmm. um, without ever 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 uh, replicating the circumstances yeah. that took place uh, in, in this instance. But you know, sooner or later, there's going to be something that's outside the parameters of what they've tested for. That's right. just, that's just but, life. And then, and then they adjust for it, so right. it will happen again. And, and, and that situation, that scenario will never happen. I mean, uh, if that scenario comes up, at least the, there'll be a procedure for that. You know, uh, so the, the I'm I, I I'm trying to see, if, like, just listening to the whole conversation, if anyone in the in this immediate conversation uh, in between Gary, Craig, and myself, are any of us against? Self-driving cars taking over. Like, yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not just talking like you know, uh, safety features enhanced by self-driving cars. I'm saying I don't want to drive ever again. Get these things all over the road. Like, is anyone against that much control? My wife. Away? Really? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Why? Uh, she thinks that she can do a better job of driving than a self-driving car. See, um, and, and and the only. Like whenever I hear that argument, and you know, I, I hear it from people who drive for a living or you know do a lot of driving uh, recreationally. It's it's kind of like when Craig says that I don't want my my surgeon to one day be an automated robot. You know, I I don't want uh, my dentist to be automated. I don't want you know this that and the other. Like let's say let's say a self-driving car. I, I had surgery by a robot. Incidentally, it was very nice. Great conversationalist. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great conversationalist. Yeah, um, no, but yeah, you know, Da Vinci. Yeah. Just, just like Watson and the uh, and, and the diagnosis, like they Tesla's already said that their software has already driven over a million miles. And when you have that kind of data put into it, you know, I don't know a single person, you know, uh, at least in my circle of friends, that has driven a million miles by themselves. So when you put all these cars out there that are sending back feedback, that are sending back experiences, that are you know that are being continuously worked on uh, through machine learning, you know uh, your wife says that she can do it better, but you know your wife she, she may can't. Have, so she, let's get over it. Yeah, it's like all right. <laughs> she may have you know 500,000 miles you know that she's driven in her lifetime. Tesla's already doubled that, and it's only been on the road for like a year and a half. Right. No, I mean the the, the reality is that when you start. Um, moving into increased automation for vehicles, and not only can each car make a decision for itself, but but you know we talk about big data with with medicine, but when you think about the experience of big data with vehicles, and you have millions of cars all providing feedback on what happens in any given set of circumstances and how to adjust for that, talk about developing the value of perfect information. I mean, the potential of, of, of being able to catalog all of these uh, incidents so that, that the vehicle that you are in has the ability to draw on the experience of millions of other vehicles in a split second. That's rem remarkable. Yeah, uh, it, it is. So, so given all this, the question that you posed is, could driving one day be illegal? Do you think that we get to that point, or, or, or is, is there always going to be someone you know who wants to you know drive their car on the open road and you know and, and with the stick shift and? Well, I I toss that out there because the the question that's really under discussion is as you start um, implementing the self-driving vehicle. Uh, and we're, I think that we will start, to, you're already seeing them on the roads in some places, but I think you'll start seeing them in real numbers uh, in the course of the next five years or so. But as you, as you do that, um, where, where are the problems going to be? Well, the problems are going to be, I think, largely in interactions between cars that are self-driving and cars that have idiots behind the wheel, <laughs> um, and and therefore one suggestion that's been made is you simply remove the idiots behind the wheel. You basically say that certainly in in some instances um, you 
are not allowed to take control of your car um, in certain places. So, for example, when I say you know could driving become illegal, uh, I, certainly I, I don't foresee that in all circumstances. But I could foresee just as as you, when you get on an interstate now. You know, you can't have a bicycle driving on an interstate. You can't have a horse-drawn vehicle driving on an interstate. I could definitely see the point um, coming where you can say, you know, if you want to drive on this interstate, you have to give up control um, behind the wheel so that you can conform with the electronic instructions that are being given on the highway for following distance, turning um, signals, and, and all of that. Now, I, I, you see, I think that that's reasonable because uh, I, I can't think of anybody really who you know, you know, enjoys driving for hours on a road on, on a on a highway. That's uh, you know, basically. You say you say no one, but that's a that's a big generalization. Well, I mean, I, you know, I can understand. Well, I guess if you have the Winnebago, you know, you, you but then again, you don't really go on the major highways. If you're getting on a major highway. Uh, you should def defer to the uh, self-driving ability of your vehicle, and then when you go off-road, and if you want to drive at that point, well, then maybe you know uh, that would be uh, okay to do. But uh, when you're getting on these highways and you're going 70, 80, you know, maybe 90 or even 100 miles an hour, depending on how fast you'll be driving, um, maybe we should turn it over to our cars and just you know leave the driving to that, and you can just do other things. Or and I think the the best example of this is that a lot of concept cars are coming out. That we just saw one from Bentley. That you know they had uh, the car of 2035, and you know, admittedly, you know, back back in the day, day, uh, you know, they had the car of the year 2000, and it was flying. Um, you know, admittedly, Bentley did not make a flying car, but what they did was they had this large plush car that kind of unraveled itself, and. No steering wheel, no speedometer, no nothing. Just a, just essentially a lounging area on wheels. And you know, you climb in, you close the 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 door closes itself, and it's off on the road. And it drives itself from point A to point B. Like, and I think car companies are hoping that public opinion is swayed that they can that they can take away control of the wheel. That you know, their their concept cars of 2030, 2040, 2050 aren't even going to have steering wheels. They're just going to be, again, just lounging areas that you climb in, say, take me here, and you wait, and then you're at the other place. Or it'll, or it'll be some version of that. Like, uh, again, I have to go back to the uh, uh, the iRobot movie, the car that Will Smith drew, drove. Uh, there was no steering wheel in there. It, it was very much like the car you described, but when you, he pushed the button, a steering wheel would come out. You know, and it would go into "quote unquote" manual mode, and then he would drive the car. Yeah, and I think that's actually a more likely scenario because there are always going to be instances where um, the technology will not be able to get you uh, with pinpoint accuracy from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. uh, roads change, road conditions change, and there are an awful lot of roads in this country that are still uh, either unmapped or badly mapped or uh, addresses or not in databases in, in the right p position. Uh, and I'm a, I, I use GPS devices. I mean, this is something that, that we do. Uh, Tech 50 Plus, we spent a lot of time looking at, at in-car navigation systems and, and uh, more often than that, the, the, the uh, portable navigation devices. And uh, it's not at all unusual uh, for an address to be the wrong place uh, on a map. Well, if that's the case and you're in a self-driving car, it's going to drive you into the wrong driveway. How do you get out of the wrong driveway if there's no steering wheel? Right, exactly. Uh, sort of like the fine-tuning. Um, uh, and I know you, you're. We we sort of we sort of grazed a little bit of an area that it's also of, of great interest to me is that uh, with GPS navigations that uh, I'm looking at right now uh, uh, the fact that my smartphone has a really good navigation the 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 dedicated navigators that are in cars or that, that you buy like the Tom Toms of the Garments have to be updated. You have to plug them into your computer to update them. But now with the mapping and and the navigation systems in our smartphones today. You don't doesn't require you to do that. They're always up to date, and if there's a change, the change is made, you know, fairly instantaneously. So, uh, 
I've given up my navigation system and uh, I'm deferring that to my iPhone uh, being my navigation system in the car. Uh, I, I've got a windshield mount that I just got for it, putting it up on that. And, uh, and uh, since I always have my iPhone with me anyway, uh, when I get in the car, if I need to go something, I could just tell it, drive me to so-and-so, drive me to Walmart, I can just tell it where. And then it just does it and, and, and with, the, uh, with the guidance. And uh, I, I think that uh, that's uh, along the lines of uh, what we're looking at you know, uh, with, with navigation. So, uh, the, uh, the navigator is, yeah, it's definitely being built into cars. And, uh, who, who were, we were just talking to someone that said that they didn't want all the navigation inside built into the car. Um, completely, yeah. completely forgot who that was, but, um, yeah, it, it, like n navigation is just going to be, you know, uh, we have, we have anti-lock oh, brakes. I and now we're going to have navigation. We were talking to Bob Levitis, Dr. That's Mac it. Levitis. Yeah, he was talking Bob to Levitis. Yeah. And looks like we just lost our guests. So oh, Good grief. Oh, no, maybe he had a lightning hit. Maybe uh, he had a lightning hit. Uh, okay, well, hopefully he'll uh, be back momentarily. Uh, All right. Well, while he's gone, I want to really drive a point home because, you know, you guys say that I want a steering wheel that I can take over and control of the car. Yeah. But... I assert, insert, I make an assertion that if driving is illegal, you want no way for people to I'm, take control cars. I'm back. back. You're back. <laughs> was, back. It a, was it a lightning strike or what? <laughs> I don't know what it was. It was the, the internet did a hiccup. Ah, okay. Um, is it, the, the numbers are, are really uh, pretty persuasive. Um, in, in terms of mitigating in favor of, of the self-driving car, um, not only in terms of, the, we're talking about 92% of all accidents are caused uh, by human error, but, um, you know, the, the predictions are that uh, using the self-driving car, we could triple the capacity of our present roadways. Mm -hmm. um, because you would no longer have to worry about human failability on on uh, following distances. That's true. Right. Although, although I mean the way the highways are now and 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 congested areas like at Los Angeles that type of thing I'm wondering if self-driving cars would speed things up. Uh, well, yes, they they would because right now um, one of the things that happens you're driving along and all of a sudden traffic slows down. Um, to either a, a crawl or, or a, a standstill. And uh, there's no accident. Um, you know, there's nothing that, that, that's blocking, and then it, the, the traffic picks up again. Yeah. That, that all has to do with queuing theory and, and you know, sort of bunching up and, and so on, um, fluid dynamics, all sorts of weird stuff. But basically, uh, it's because we're stupid. <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, there, there's, there's no cause for it. You know, it just, it just sort of happens. And by regulating following distances uh, electronically, uh, you should be able to eliminate the vast... Uh, the vast majority of that sort of clumping up uh, situation that that slows you down on the highways for no apparent reason. Now, obviously, if there's an accident, you know why it's slowing down. But but you know my my guess is that uh, uh, for most of us, we're in traffic slowdowns far more often where there's no apparent reason. Yeah, and that's maddening. It's frustrating. I've, that's happened to us a, a couple of times. Uh, in one case, it added like uh, uh, like seven or eight hours to a trip that uh, should have only taken like 11 hours and, uh, it, and, and there was no there were no accidents nothing we just well, were, at that point they probably cleaned it up before you even got there yeah it was just it was just terrible right. but with some uh, cars are, are they going to be able to monitor you know road conditions not only in, for the car itself but what's up ahead and that type of thing so they can kind well, of yeah well, we've already seen that technology uh, from Google self driving cars where it takes like uh, like a couple hundred scans a minute. Uh, while it's driving, so like it can actively scan for uh, bicyclists, for pedestrians, for debris in the roadway, for uh, kids chasing a ball into the roadway. Uh, you know, whatever it is, cars actively scan their surroundings, not just themselves and you know and the road. And the other thing is that when you have uh, uh, the V2V system, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication system in place, 
um, a car that's that's uh, five miles ahead of you, uh, or ten miles, or twenty miles ahead of you, will be able to tell uh, this this greater presence, sort of you know the Watson of the road, um, what's going on, and advise you uh, or or reprogram you to take a detour if that's going to be uh, more time effective. And we do see it in our GPS devices today. Ways that now. Ways. Yeah. Yep. Our GPS devices now will actually tell you, oh, traffic. There's traffic is slowed down. There's an additional four minutes to your 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 trip or whatever. We see that happen in our navigation systems today. So obviously, that uh, similar technology uh, would be built into the self-driving cars. Oh, listen, the music's playing already. The first half hour is already up. Time flies when you're having fun. Uh, Gary K is here with us. Uh, we're talking about uh, self-driving cars and could driving one day be illegal? Uh, we're talking about the uh, the situation where there was a fatality with a self-driving car. We're going to take a short break. We'll be back. Uh, we've got a news test bullet review from Marty Winston coming up as well. You're listening to the Computer America Show. Ben, Gary, and I will be back right after this. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Sometimes, disaster strikes. Data can be lost due to many different reasons. Accidental reformatting, power spikes, virus attacks. Zero Assumption Recovery provides a suite of highly effective and thorough data recovery software for Windows operating systems. ZA is suitable for home users and small businesses who need a powerful data recovery solution for Windows and Linux file systems. Go to z-a-recovery.com. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> That's so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Yeah, my Raspberry Pi programs keep giving me the raspberries. Marty Winston with a news tips bullet review for Computer America. This time the kid of FireX talking smoke and carbon monoxide alarm. Any smoke alarm can beep when there's a fire. But the Kida FireX combo ionization smoke and electrochemical carbon monoxide alarm can talk. Not much, not often, but the message is fire or warning carbon monoxide, one of a few maintenance messages. It also sounds an 85 decibel alarm. This is AC powered with AA cell backup and interconnectable, so all of them in a house can alert when any one of up to 18 of them triggers. Bottom line, equipping your home with Kida FireX Smart Combo Smoke and Carbon Monoxide Alarms that talk and interconnect is like keeping a fire lookout team on guard and connected all through the house. Marty Winston, News Tips Bulletin for Computer America. Hey, welcome back to the Computer America Show here, 30 minutes past the hour on a wonderful Friday. As uh, Well, wonderful in most places, but a Friday nonetheless. As we are talking to Mr. Gary Kay and uh, from Tech Fifty Plus, and yeah, you know, uh, really focusing in on on uh, self driving cars because, you know, uh, right now we've mainly been talking about the implications that you know getting people out from behind the wheel is going to cause less accidents, but to a lot of people, I'm not sure that they truly grasp how big of a transition 
to self-driving cars would be because it doesn't just affect your morning commute for an hour, although that is a good side effect. It affects almost everything. Like, like, like it affects a lot of industries. It, it, it involves uh, the healthcare industry because they don't have to deal with uh, you know car accident victims anymore, and that's going to drastically reduce the clientele of privately owned hospitals, which is, of course, going to affect their bottom lines. So that means they have to charge more in other places. Uh, you don't have any of the industries involved in uh, in cars, uh, you know, uh, accident repairs and things like that. You know, admittedly there will be accidents, but the number of accidents will be drastically reduced. So a lot of them are going to go out of business. Uh, the need to even own your own car might even go away because let's face it, we already have things like Lyft and Uber, who uh, you know, it's kind of like ride sharing services that will you know, hey, just have a self driving car and get an app and get enough apps and enough self-driving cars, and who even needs to own a car if you have a car on demand anyways? Uh, you know, and then there's things like uh, the insurance companies who, you know, who has to insure the car anymore uh, because, you know, they don't get in accidents. It affects so many industries, and, like, I think it's going to be a huge economic boon because, hey, you know, less loss of life, less uh, lost wages due to car accidents, but you have to admit, there's going to be a lot of money lost in a lot of industries, if self-driving cars come in too quickly, well, that that that, that insurance is uh, like is an interesting point. I mean, who do you insure that your self-driving car, the the person who owns it, or if you're you don't own it? I mean, it gets really strange, isn't it? It, it gets even hairier than that. And in fact, this is a, a major problem for the government because if you're not touching the steering wheel, or if there is no steering wheel. Um, then who is responsible? Is it is it the, the manufacturer of the car? Is it the maker of the software that went into the car? Is it a local government entity that may be responsible for maintaining the uh, the vehicle to to vehicle communication system? Um, so it is clear, uh, and again, this is something th that I heard from, from Transportation Secretary Fox a couple of weeks ago, it is clear that the entire issue of, of liability um, and, and the role of insurance in the self-driving car is going to be uh, changed on its, on its head. I mean, it's not going to bear any resemblance to what we have today. But just who is going to be responsible? Will it be the governments? Will it be the automakers? Will it be the software makers? Will it be a pooled responsibility? None of that's clear. I I will say that I believe it was BM, uh, BMW or you know one of these other car manufacturers that w they said when they put out a self-driving car, they will take responsibility for it because you know, it like I know that no one really wants to take you know uh, responsibility. But I think this car manufacturer, and I'm gonna have to, I, I'm like 95% sure it was BMW, but they said that you know if you purchase one of our cars and it has self-driving uh, car technology, or yeah, self-driving car technology, then we believe in our product so much, we will, you know, if if uh, if the software is found at fault for any accident, we will take full responsibility for that. Like they are really stepping up and using it as a selling point. Is that any any different than uh, than products today that we see uh, where manufacturers uh, uh, own up to the responsibility if there's a product it's always here if there's a product defect or if, if it's the if shown to be the fault of the pro our pro the product we're going to either refund you or we're going to take we're going to uh, deal know, with the, the damages yeah yeah the, so how would a self-driving car be any different if it's the manufacturer's uh, responsibility? Well, I mean, that's, that's just it. it. It is that you've moved the responsibility from the individual driver or owner to the manufacturer. And you're right. Uh, obviously, we have that model uh, for, for many, many manufactured goods today. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, there's no real difference there. But... Uh, right now, you know, one of the difficulties in in moving towards the self-driving car is the fact that uh, automobiles uh, and the behavior of automobiles uh, are regulated on a number of different levels. Uh, you have local ordinances in terms of speed. You have state ordinances in terms of licensing both the drivers and the vehicles, and you have federal 
uh, regulations in terms of automotive safety. Uh, and these are all often contradictory or, or, or uh, confusing. And in order to get uh, the self-driving car out there, uh, all of this regulatory stuff is going to have to get straightened out. Um, you know, you can't have a situation where in New York, uh, you know, the driver is responsible for, for what goes on in the car, while in Florida, it's the manufacturer. And uh, right now, because of uh, uh, the fact that, that motor vehicle regulation is locally controlled, uh, you know, there is no clear path forward. We're already seeing there are something like uh, 16 states, or I, th I think that may be the number, that have some form of regulation about self-driving cars. Some of them insist you have to have, have the ability of somebody to get control behind the wheel. Others say no. So we're already seeing the, this kind of regulation hodgepodge. Well, yeah. well and it's going to have to be cleared up, and I, and I believe it's probably going to have to be on a federal level because, quite frankly, I mean, roads cross state lines and people cross state lines without having to have passports and papers, and I think cars are going to be need to be the same way. You're going to have to have some sort of overall overseeing re federal regulation that's going to be uh, enforced no matter what state you're in. And well, I, I think you know, the, the, the issue, Craig, is not that that isn't the ideal solution, because I think it is the ideal solution. The, the question is, how do, you give, how do you get 50 jurisdictions to give up their control over regulating what goes on on their roads? Well, we, 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 well, we, we see it now. The Supreme Court will say, you know, this is the, fed, this is the law of the land, and, uh, you know, your, your state law takes, uh, does not take precedence over, uh, over our ruling, and... Uh, It'll have to be uh, ironed out, but I, I, I mean, it's not the first example of saying, "Hey, this is a federal law and it's in place, and this is this is what you're going to do." I mean, we're seeing that happen again with cannabis. You know, uh, we're seeing some states will make it legal some way. Well, I think eventually it's just going to have to become a federal mandate because in states say it's legal, but the federal says no, it's a cl it's a class one you know drug, and you, and you can't uh, you can't you know you can't have it or possession more than an ounce. Or, so I, I think it's going to have to be eventually, and it'll come to, you know, a case will come up to the Supreme Court, and it's going to have to be regulated, just like abortion. You know, it was on a state-to-state -state thing, but it, was, it became a federal mandate, a mandate. Well, let me, take, let me take a slightly contrarian view here, which is that um, come, come November, uh, many of us are going to be voting for the next president of these United States, or at least for electors uh -huh. for that president. But the regulations under which we vote, even though we're all you know, casting our ballots for the same couple of candidates, but the regulations under which we vote, even though it's for a federal election, can vary from state to state. And oh. we've, we've seen all of the, the issues on, on voter, voter rights questions, and it's still a, a state issue, even though that it's a national election. I just don't think, you know, I, I don't think that, that we're going to resolve it that easily, and I suspect that when push comes to shove, the technology will be in place, the, the responsibility uh, regulations will be in place, and that the last thing that comes together will be the regulatory environment covering the 50 states. And, and uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. I mean, I mean, if if uh, uh, so many of the things that we do today follow that same path, uh, have, have followed that same path. So, uh, uh, um, well, it makes me a little crazy in part. You know, is 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 I think you know um, one of the things that we spend a lot of time uh, focusing on at, at, at Tech Fifty Plus is uh, the electric assist bike or the e-bike, and the rules are dramatically different from state to state. Um, California a few months ago actually le legalized the sucker. Um, in, in New York it's illegal. You can't have an, you can't drive an e-bike on the street legally. I mean people do it, but it is illegal because the state of New York can't come to grips with whether or not it's a motor vehicle or a bicycle. Now the federal government has rules that basically says it's legal to sell these things because it, it satisfies you know, House Rules 727, uh, House, House Resolution 727, uh, which is part of the consumer product safety, blah, blah, blah. But it basically says e-bikes are legal. But you go into New York State and um, you want to ride a, an e-bike in Manhattan, 
um, you can get ticketed for it. Even have your bike confiscated. Well, you know, again, and that's how th that's that's how our legal process works. So then that one will go all the way to the Supreme Court, and you know, it'll, it'll, it'll and then it'll someone will have to be made a, an example of, and or the situation will be made an example of, and then it will be, be decided and say, okay, that's it. It's a federal issue. In New York, you can't no, you can't do anything about it. This person. And uh, and that's basically how our things work in our country. So I think we'll see the same process happen with self-driving cars. Someone will do something that sh that one state sh says you can't do, even though the federal government says you can, and uh, and then it'll get passed. And uh, it's it's un it, but it, a lot of these arguments are you know might even become invalid you know from the get-go if let's say you know people don't even have to own cars anymore because then it's not the it's not the consumer that has to deal with all these regulations it would be the businesses that have to you know uh they have to deal with them to let people you know use the service so yeah i i'm just ne not nearly that sanguine uh ben about the the notion that this is going to be as easily resolved as as a single <coughs> supreme court case simply because um you know under the separation of powers with rights that are reserved to the states and, and, and rights that are reserved to the federal government, um, it, it's not clear to me uh, that the feds would have necessarily the right uh, in all of these instances to step in and say, okay, we're now going to nationalize uh, the way the driver's licenses are issued. Right. Um, to, to me, though, it's more capitalistic in, in a sense. That let's say a company can say, all right, subscribe to our service. You know, uh, 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, whatever it is. You know, uh, you know, let's say they they're selling pitches for the price of maintenance on a car. You can have a car at your doorstep whenever you want and never have to deal with maintenance ever again. And you know, admittedly, this is going to be in cities first and work its way out to you know to small communities. But it's it's completely possible. That that could happen, and so if a service like that takes off, as we're seeing, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft, that a lot of people, uh, that uh, admittedly younger generation, in larger cities, they're they don't even own cars; they just use Uber and Lyft all the time. And if a service like that can take off, and we see car car sales decline, blah blah blah, then you know the market speaks, and then there's only room for instead of the big car manufacturers that sell their directly to consumers, there's only room for these services that we see pop up that let people use cars occasionally. Well, and that's why General Motors is making a huge investment in Lyft for precisely right. that reason. But I, I, you know, you're also getting into uh, an issue of individual tastes um, in that uh, you know, uh, do you? Uh, uh, you know, do you still want the right to, to drive a Porsche versus uh, an SUV? Yeah, yeah. The, there will always be the ones that will want to drive their own car and you know have have the muscle car that they you know that they always want to drive it on these huge courses. Um, you know, I, but, I look yeah. at I look at this entire question somewhat differently because again, I try and look at this from the perspective of a fifty plus audience, and um, you know, their concerns are are a little different. Uh, the vast majority of of folks over fifty plus, you know, over fifty, already have vision vision issues. Um, as they get into their sixties and seventies, more and more of them have uh, issues with driving at night. Um, and and further beyond that, uh, issues of orientation, and so uh, you know the, there's there are so many debates on uh, on the question of you know at what point should you no longer be allowed on the road, and people in their 70s, 80s, 90s uh, are very fearful that if they lose their license, they lose their lives because their their mobility comes to an end. Self-driving cars and self-driving cars serviced by an Uber or a Lyft could be a huge, huge successful answer to that entire range of issues, and that's what what I'm hoping for. Yeah, I, and I grew up in South Florida. You know, South Florida for 25 years. If there was ever a place that had uh, that, that had that debate as often, I don't. You know, maybe Reno, Nevada, but um, <laughs> having a, an aging population behind the wheel that you know, traditionally you had to rely on taxis, and taxis weren't even that uh, weren't even that useful. 
uh, you know, when it's an everyday occurrence, let alone you know every couple days. Uber and Lyft, I you know, I think if it can chauffeur my drunk friends around after Friday and Saturday night, I think it can handle you know uh, someone needing to get to the grocery store, someone needing to run errands, someone needing to you know go out to the movies once in a while, and these services are very 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 useful for you know the everyday thing. Uh, you know taxis always seem like a once in a long while thing. You know I need to get to an airport. But Uber and Lyft seem like a very easy, you know, everyday thing. Right, and they're certainly be, they've certainly become far more cost-effective than a taxi, uh, and they're convenient. And when they move to a self-driving model, you know, slam dunk for an awful lot of people. That's going to be a major solution. That's going to be a lot cheaper than than buying and maintaining a, a, your own car, and I agree with that entirely. But how long do you think it's is that going to take? It's going to take a while. Well, it, yeah, you look at look at look at how long it it takes now. Um, you know, it used to be when I was a kid. Um, you know, the Neanderthal era. <laughs> uh, most people would would keep their cars for like three, four years, and now people are keeping their cars for seven, ten, twelve years. Uh, and so, when you think about how long it's likely to uh, take to transition the, the the vast bulk of the vehicle stock that's on the road uh, to a new technology, you're talking you know twenty years easy, twenty five years more. Well. Uh here, here's an article, and I remember it clearly because I was so off the wall. And admittedly, you know, it's a couple years in the future. But uh, Tesla making claims that they can have a self-driving car on the road by 2020. You know, that that was their that was their goal. And uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk, he's like, yeah, 2020, uh, forget that. We're gonna do 2018, 2017. You know, they're, they're working on it. But as soon as they said that uh, Tesla's, uh, I'm sorry, that that Mercedes could have some. Uh, by 2020, I believe, as well, uh, Uber bought 100,000 self-driving Mercedes S-Classes. Like, they put a pre-order down for 100 self 100,000 self-driving cars to put in places like uh, Rome and, or uh, Paris and New York and these large metropolitan area with, like, a lot of tourists. Because, tour, you know, uh, services like Uber and Lyft are popular with tourists because you can't exactly take your car everywhere. So... We're seeing that these, you know, that Uber and Lyft and these other ride-sharing companies, they're so eager that they're willing to put down millions of dollars uh, before they're even made to get these things on the road. Like they, they'd rather have self-driving cars than random people that just sign up for the service. They, they want these as bad as, you know, as bad as we do. Well, and I think that they're actually going to be a major motivator uh, behind bringing this. Uh, about, but there's still, I mean, w w again, what concerns me is that there are still so many moving parts, uh, no pun intended, uh, before this can all come to fruition. And the whole, the, the insurance, the uh, the vehicle to vehicle communications, the regulatory issues, the licensing issues. Uh, and I think the joke is, despite what happened with this this Tesla fatality, the technology is the furthest ahead of all of the elements that we need to bring this together. You know, they've got the technology mostly nailed down. Yeah, there are still a few glitches here and there, but for the most part, they got it. It's the rest of it that's really lagging behind. I'm hoping technology does its, does its magic, and we've seen it in a lot of different fields that. When technology is present, innovation is you know infinitely faster. You know, where it took you know uh, 50 years to get to a certain point, add computers. All of a sudden, we're 10 years into it, five years. We get the same amount of innovation in a much, much, much shorter time frame. So I'm hoping uh, that technology, with this increased communication, with increased sharing and that kind of thing, uh, I don't have to wait 30 years to stop driving. That's I I really hope it's in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So, I would like nothing more than to be able to get into a self-driving car in the course of the next five years. 
and not have to deal. I mean, there are times when I like getting behind the wheel. There, there are some, some parkways. We have these things called parkways in the Northeast <laughs> um, that, that you know you don't have in, in, in many other parts of the country uh, that were originally designed, many of them in the 1930s, uh, to try and be attractive places to drive. And they're like, windy and curvy and, and yeah, we very have nicely landscaped, and you can't have trucks on them. And we they're have, a lot of fun to drive on. Yeah, we have um, the, the Blue Ridge Highway is the one we have. Parkway, in the, yeah. Yes, yes. You know, um, Skyline Drive through the Shenandoahs. I mean, there's you know, some gorgeous stretches. Um, and I, I'd hate to see that stuff go away. Well, uh, but at the same time, day in and day out, my getting on to, uh, to Interstate you know, 684 or 84 to, to, to get from point A to point B, yeah, yeah, who needs it? Let somebody else deal with it. Let a machine deal with it. Yeah. Well, could could uh, could uh, self-driving cars could still drive on on these uh, beautiful? Uh, and then you just sit back and look around. Yeah. Yeah, I, I still think you know I, I've I've enjoyed sports cars since I was a kid. So if, and and I still have moderately. Okay. Well, there's that there's that other some of it. So. There's that other element. I mean, we're talking about time passing. Okay, so you come from a generation, and I come from a generation that. Uh, enjoys driving but you know again it's like smartphones I mean we have kids growing up today growing up you know with smartphones and how, how, how could it have been any other different they didn't know any other way but you know we remember the days before we had uh, smartphones or even cell phones for that matter and uh, so maybe it's a generational thing maybe in, in the next generation they, they'll just assume that's, that it was always that way I but, heard the funniest story about a, a generational divide was uh, this gentleman had his kids, uh, you know, and, and they were watching television. You know, and, and the kids were, you know, like three and five, young, young kids. And he's, you know, he, he says that they stream their television, you know, so Netflix and Hulu and whatnot. Or if they do watch television, they time shift it, you know, so you go back and you can fast forward. Well, they were watching live television, and, you know, the three and the five-year-old completely lost it when commercials started coming on. They're like, you know... Why are these people talking to us? Get back to the program. Get back to the program. Stop, you know, uh, make a stop. And he's like, we can't. It's live television. Like they, to them, because most of their media that they consumed was time shifted or streamed, they never really had to deal with television ads. And they got mad when they had an ad break in a television show. Well, then I, I'm not going to predict that that you know people are going to want to bring back ads, but I will say that that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of instances, and we're seeing more of them, where older technologies are coming back into favor. So, for example, vinyl records. Who would have, who would have thought that vinyl records would regain popularity, um, you know, a, a, amongst the millennials? But it's happening. Yep, it's Muscle really cars. Weird. Muscle cars, you know, the, the, you know, the old Pontiac GTOs and the old Camaros and the old Mustangs are becoming very popular again. So while sort of the, the, there's a, a general progression, you know, I don't give up on the idea that there are always going to be folks who are going to enjoy some of this older stuff where they can, well, you, know, uh, you know, do it themselves. Well, you know, there'll always be that. I mean, uh, there, there are people who still, you know, like uh, eight-track tapes for some reason, uh, and, or they'll have a... Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I think I might draw the line there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but but, or, or but I think they might have but, in their cameras rather than digital cameras. It's, but oh, the thing know. is, like, they're, they're, they're reaching back into the past, and they're pulling the good stuff. Like, it's not like we go back there and say, oh, the 50s, they're great, you know, uh, hoop skirts or, or, or uh, 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 poodle skirts. They're coming back. But they're not reaching back going... Eh, polio wasn't that bad. I, like they're, they're just they're just picking the really good stuff. So you know there, there's gonna be a progression, but you can always and with technology and the way you can you know store information, store data, and be able to you know uh, be able to replicate things. Uh, you're always gonna be able to pull back the good things, but leave the annoying stuff and the bad stuff behind. That's awesome. And you know what? But I do hear from kids um, who who are looking at these 1960s and 70s cars and going, boy, I really like to get my hands on one. Why? Because there are no computers in it, and I can fix it myself. Well, <laughs> that's true. C cars are getting pretty convoluted. I, I, I have a friend that bought a, a Mustang 5.0, and he uh, and he fixed it up. That uh, yeah, I know people who who do enjoy that part of it. Cars are just simpler. I mean, By the way, what, what's a carburetor, right? 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I heard that the... Uh, That's the, the thing with the crank and the steam. You have to go out there and... Yeah. <laughs> I heard there's a the, there's a global polio threat coming back again. So you know, yeah. the blast of the past is no weird stuff. things. Weird things. Uh, but uh, so, do we have another topic for the second? We have, we have lots of other stuff to lots talk about. Lots of stuff. Yeah. No. Okay. I, but I just want to make sure we're finished with this. But uh, yeah. Okay. So. Uh, um, because I promise I could, you know, I alone. You, know, you two can go take a nap. I, I alone could fill up a whole another hour with, <laughs> with stuff driving cars. I could do it by myself. Yeah. So no. Ne- next hour, I'd like to talk about s- some some progress in wearables and some some new um, you know healthcare technologies that are coming along and some some uh, issues about information gathering and and so on. Okay. And also maybe talk a little bit about Amazon be the dominant player in smart homes. Uh, yeah, yeah. Really interesting stuff. Um, yeah, you know, exactly. e- Echo's going to rule the world. All right. And. Uh, you maybe talk about maybe that Apple has missed the boat on VR. We'll talk about that as well. Yeah, that's uh, worth the 30-second spot, yeah. <laughs> this is the Computer America Show. We're just like a momentary break, and we'll be back with uh, Gary Kay. Uh, he is the uh, founder and chief content officer of Tech50+. Uh, we're going to be right back with him. Also, have our social media winner coming up in this hour. Coming hour. You're listening to the Computer America Show. Stay with us. Broadcasting live, it's the only national radio talk show on computers to air every weeknight, Computer America, hosted by national columnist Craig Crossman. The first hour's behind us, but there's still more of tech news, tech talk, and your phone calls. We're being beamed nationwide at ComputerAmerica.com. You got computer problems? Bring them on. You're listening to Computer America. Computers run the world, and we run computers. Call us or send us an email to live at ComputerAmerica.com. Hello and welcome into Hour 2 of the nation's longest-running, nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers. This is the Computer America Show, and I'm your host, Craig Crossman. And I'm your co-host, Ben. And we continue on with Gary Kay. Uh, He is the founder and chief content officer of uh, Tech50+. Plus. Uh, if you missed the first hour, listen, we archive this entire show, and uh, if you missed any portion of it, you can listen to it again after it's over. Uh, head over to ComputerAmerica.com and click on the archives uh, on the menu bar on any page there, and uh, you'll be able to listen as well as watch uh, any Computer America show that we've done in the past. Uh, we we archive them; they go our archives go way way back, and uh, you can see and listen to everything there uh, as well. Uh, so in the meantime, uh, Gary continues on with us. Uh, we're just finishing. Uh, an hour basically talking about self-driving cars and could driving one... And how they're the doom of the future. This is awful. Yeah. Could driving be, one day be illegal? All these things, uh, questions that hopefully we've uh, we've touched. We certainly haven't solved anything because... Uh, but certainly have talked Forget about... You. I've submitted legislation. It's go- it, it's going. I've, I'm, I'm trying to solve things here. <laughs> uh, it's not good legislation, but I've, I submitted it. Yeah. Local congressman and then work my way up. Well... So Gary, uh, you know, we like you, since you're our, our our correspondent here. Why don't you uh, pick uh, the next topic? Because we there's so many. There's net neutrality. I mean, you've got Apple missing the boat on VR, Amazon. Uh, I mean, I mean, we got so many different topics. So why don't you pick something and let's do it? So let's start off with uh, Amazon's play in in the smart home field. Okay. Uh, and I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago uh, in. Uh, outside of Washington D.C., called the uh, the M Enabling Summit, which is all about mobile technologies for the elderly and the disabled. And uh, I was rather surprised to see that Amazon uh, had a major presence and was a major sponsor at this conference. Um, and basically, their thrust was that. Uh, they they could use the uh, uh, Amazon um, System, you know, whether you want to call it Alexa because that's her name, uh, or the Echo, or the Dot, or you know, the Tap, whichever of their devices you want to use, um, as the the hub for smart home technology. I was also impressed when I saw it at CES this past January that Amazon is now becoming uh, sort of the developing the development platform of choice for many of these uh, smart home um, manufacturers. One of the problems in the smart home field 
has been that the stuff is just too complex for many people to deal with, uh, whether it's Z-Wave or Zigbee or wiring this or wiring that, it's still not ready for prime time. And Apple has talked about HomeKit, but uh, HomeKit, frankly, is, is really more theory than it is practice at this point, whereas uh, the Amazon folks have gotten out there with software development kits, and they're now uh, able to talk to thermostats like you know, Honeywell's Lyric. Uh, they're, they're able to talk to uh, entire systems like Philips Hue Lighting uh, and so on. Now, this is not to say that the siloed folks like you know, Samsung SmartThings or, uh, or the Nest group and so on are going to go away anytime soon but it seems that if there is a migration towards any one um, sort of ubiquitous platform it seems to be moving towards Amazon hmm. okay well you know I remember when Amazon was it first started it was a they delivered books it was it's, it's how it started out it was a, a, a supplier of books uh, a good resource and the <laughs> And, and then they killed that market, and those only Barnes and Noble, and they're you know closing shop left and right. So and they've expanded to this, um, you know, one stop has everything that you could possibly want from you know appliances to you name it. To I food. just bought dog food off of Amazon. Yeah, just bought dog food. I mean, I mean, I just, just bought a case of Crystal Light because I was running out in my grocery store, so I just <laughs> got on Amazon and said, all right, you know, send me a case of this stuff. It'll last me half a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. Uh, do you live in a place where the if you have a Prime membership, you get the same day delivery, or is it still? Uh, no, I, I'm still a little too far right? out. If I were in Manhattan, you know that that would work. But I'm uh, I'm pretty much out in the boonies. I, mean, I still have farms on my road. So <laughs> okay. Real, I really do. Really? Okay. Yeah, horse farms, uh, dairy farms. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know those still existed. I thought they were all just mega corporations by now. <laughs> No, no. I, I've stepped in the wharf stuff enough to tell you that it's still real. Okay. <laughs> that keeps you keeps you grounded when you do that. Um, so you're right. I mean, so you think Amazon's going to be the dominant player now with smart homes because they have these little buttons now you can push. So if you're running low to tide, you push the tide button, or if you're running, you know, you're running low on uh, some other product, you just push the button now and, and it orders it for you. Um, you know, m my daughter and I actually had this conversation earlier today um, over the fact that she said, well, you know, when, when Amazon first came out with these buttons, um, I thought it was really a waste. And she says, but now I realize that there are certain commodities that I do run out of periodically, and just being able to push one button to refill them would make perfect sense. Yeah. So I, I think that they're on to something. I mean, I... Um, I hate to give one company too much credit, but these guys really seem to be able to nail it just about with everything they do. And I, uh, you know, um, I, I give them, I give Jeff Bezos so much credit for having stuck with it for so many years. You know, quarter after quarter of losses, year after year of losses. Uh, nobody thought he could make it. And, you know, he's really proven to the world that he has uh, an amazing vision. Well, you know, I mean, the, mostly like, good. Uh, we're just going to ignore the Amazon Fire Phone, though. So, <laughs> like, you know, they, they're not going to get it right a hundred percent of the right. time. We, you and I both know it. Um, and you know, I give them credit. I give them credit for for trying stuff. Um, you know, there are other things that I, I'm I'm less than thrilled about the fact that that there's still a lot of siloed stuff out there in terms of their music and uh, their video and, and so on. Um, I wish it weren't, but, uh, you know, uh, they, figured out, they figured out what we as consumers want, and increasingly they are figuring out ways of getting it to us uh, on, on, like, zero notice. Right. I mean, if, uh, we have a Keurig coffee maker, and, you know, those little Keurig, the little K-cups, you, you one day you realize, oh my gosh, I'm almost out of these, or I'm out of them, you know, and, and uh, all you have to do is push a button, and lo and behold, all, another box of K cups just uh, appear on your front doorstep, you know, it's just uh, yeah, within a day or two days. I mean, it's yeah. just it's, it's it's pretty remarkable, and um, the fact that the that I see Amazon moving so strongly into 
the home, uh, the connected home space, uh, and they understand it. They understand the need for uh, a simple uh, system that doesn't require wiring, and increasingly, uh, voice recognition is really going to be the key to it. Well, the Echo platform, I remember when it first came out, one of our other correspondents, Sandy Berger, had picked it up for like $90. Uh, she was like, you know, the, uh, uh, because she was early on the, the list. And uh, today, you know, she loves it. She wouldn't be without it because Alexa, keep, uh, the Echo uh, keeps learning. It gets new abilities like almost on a weekly basis. Oh, now it can turn your lights on. Oh, now it can get, you know, you can do this. And uh, it just, it's the same Echo, but it just, they keep giving it new abilities to, to do without having... Yeah, in fact, you say weekly. I get emails from Amazon just about every single week talking about the new capabilities and the new connectivity. Yeah, and uh, she has one like the, uh, in the uh, room. She just picked up the dot, I believe it was, uh, so she, uh, which is like an extension of... Uh, so well, it's she, like a mini, it's a mini Echo. Yeah, exactly, and... Uh, the fact that she has Alexa on, and, and, and she's technologically savvy. I mean, that's what she does. She's a, a, a consumer electronics expert, and uh, she's absolutely in love with this Echo. You know, it, it just does more and more things. It gets new. Well, it can order you a car or pizza and, yeah. you know. You can, basically. Well, yeah. Order a yeah. pizza. Turn, turn on your lights, open and close your blinds. I mean, the, the, yeah. of course, they, they love doing this demo with the blinds, and I go... How many people do you know who are putting automated blinds in all over their house? I know, ah, but, you know, or automated lights. Well, the automated lights isn't so bad, but you know, certainly like things like garage doors and yeah. um, and, and and door and window sensors and and uh, thermostats and you know the smoke smoke detectors and being able to have um, centralized systems, and for for those of us of a certain age who either are caregivers for very elderly parents, or who are looking towards a, a day where we need to be taking care of ourselves, um, and the notion of putting sensors in various places to monitor our comings or goings, monitor whether we're taking our pills, monitoring whether we're using our coffee makers, things of that sort. Um, the, the, the potential here is, is just tremendous, and they've really made it easy to use in ways unlike most of the other systems. Well, that's it. Now, what about Apple's HomeKit or the Samsung SmartThings? And uh, are, are, are you saying that they're going to become like the Betamax? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Um, I, I'm saying that um, just as in the, the VHS beta uh, debate, eventually there will be uh, a dominant common platform. And right now, uh, I'm not saying that, that the die is cast, but I'm saying that I, I think based on what I'm seeing, uh, Amazon is more likely to, to be the winner in this battle than anybody else. And what do you, what do you attribute that to? Is it because uh, Amazon's model was, let's make things that will just make it easier for people to order stuff from Amazon. I mean, that, that always seemed to be the case. You, you buy this, and it's really great, but you know, its primary function is for you to order things from Amazon. Uh, and and uh, Echo kind of started out that way, um, um, and so many of the products still are that way. That just makes it easier to order stuff from Amazon. <laughs> you know, is that well, the is that the magic a, a, a big element of it. But the other thing is, I think it has to do with sort of, you know, the your whole notion of an ecosystem, and you know how proprietary. Um, you want to be, and it's sort of like it's the the Android versus uh, you know iOS approach. Um, you know, do you want to do you want to tightly control everything the way that Apple does, or do you want to uh, open up the platform so as many people as possible can participate and and uh, help you promulgate it? And that seems to be the approach that Apple that uh, Amazon has taken. And uh, I think it's proving to be successful because I think that, that folks you know, like a Phillips, uh, like a, a Honeywell, are basically saying, well, we don't necessarily have the wherewithal to make an entire ecosystem. We don't necessarily want to make an entire ecosystem, nor do we necessarily want to be part of um, you know, jumping through the hoops that Apple wants. 
and this is a, a way to get our product uh, out there and, and make it link with lots of other stuff that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with us. Okay, well, what about Amazon's uh, uh, foray into drone delivery? I mean, is that do you think that's ever going to happen? Do you think oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, you know, disruptive technologies aren't always going to be successful, but I think in, in many cases they will. And when you look at, uh, I think there are a lot of parallels between drone delivery and, and self-driving cars. Um, you know, right now, you know, FedEx and, and, and those guys are spending, you know, gazillions of dollars on fleets of trucks um, that are very inefficient. Um, and if, if you could have a fleet of drones that operated from, from warehouses and took stuff directly to customers, dropped it off, and flew back for the next delivery, well, that's great. Now, it, certainly it's not going to work in every environment. It can't. You know, it's certainly not going to work in an urban environment. Well, you can do drop it off on the roof. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, out, out in the boonies where I live, um, where where the the UPS guy you know goes on a route and he leaves his warehouse in uh, Watertown, Connecticut at six in the morning and finishes up his rounds at, uh, at at six at night. He's out there for for twelve hours, you know, and it may take him you know ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes to to go from point A to point B to deliver one you know ten or twenty or fifty dollar package. That's not particularly cost effective. If you had a drone that cost next to nothing to operate, um, you know, that, that could go out, you know, fly it out there, drop it off and come back inside of, you know, twenty minutes, half an hour, and it cost you a few cents worth of electric uh, charging power to get it done, well, you know, why not? Yeah, exactly. Um. Uh, okay. Well. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that I kind of want to go back to uh, that we gloss over. I mean, this whole conversation started off with uh, with healthcare and technology and things like that, and you know, Amazon Alexa. And, but uh, one thing there you mentioned was you know people who uh, you mentioned you know uh, people who may have to take care of really old parents or people who may need to be take care of, uh, taking care of them themselves. Uh, I don't know. Uh, if you've been following much about what's been coming out of Japan, but obviously Japan with their you know their population pyramid, what have you, uh, they have a large amount of, of elderly, and they don't have a lot of young, younger folks to get into the healthcare industry and take care of them. So they're really leading the way in terms of of uh, digital companions. I want to say, like Craig, we just had one on the show named Oh the robots, uh, yeah, little robots, yeah, robots. Uh, we had one on the show called. Uh, I, Ibo, or uh, no, no, uh, 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 big eye. There, you go. That, that's yes. what, and it looked like a little trash can with a you know big camera on it. Um, how how do you feel that those kinds of technologies, where you know uh, for for the elderly, they'll have a a little robotic companion that can follow them around the house, be close by, you know, keep track of their appointments, you know, uh, set reminders so they remember to do stuff, maybe even uh, you know call for cars and things like that. Be two way be a two way communicator. How do you feel about these you know these robotic companions that may you know get more traction? You know what the biggest obstacle is? Uh, stairs. Yes. <laughs> you got it. That's the biggest obstacle. Well, just have uh, one on each floor. Um, every everything else is terrific. Yeah, it 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 it's happening. Um. You know, one of the big issues in aging is um, isolation and social isolation. And uh, the studies that that I've looked at basically said that um, social isolation could be more damaging to uh, the well-being of, of someone elderly than almost any medical condition. And if you can help that person stay connected um, even if it's through a robot, um, some way of interacting, then you improve the quality of life. It would be nice if it would be a, a warm human being, um, but hey, you know, uh, having somebody there to remind you of when to take your meds, having somebody there um, who can uh, sort of keep track that you haven't fallen down, make sure you're getting your meals, I think all of that's quite valuable. 
there are other systems that I think we're going to see coming into into place um, in, in terms of connected healthcare monitoring vital signs and so on that these things can't necessarily do, um, but they are going to be able to do a lot. You don't think they'll be able to, I mean, uh, we're already looking at uh, as much as Apple is behind the game, they do have the Apple Watch, and the Apple Watch is being used more and more to track vitals of patients uh, for, for doctors. You know, they have a lot of apps that will, uh, you know, say, hey, get, uh, you know, get this or that or the other, and monitor your health continuously, and, you know, and then we'll be able to look at your overall health and not just the snapshot of when you come into the clinic. I mean, you know, tie something like an Apple Watch to a smart, you know, a smart home caregiving device, you know, a little robot, and all of a sudden, yeah, then they can keep track of you. It, it's, uh, you know, connected systems are very, very interconnected. So here's the problem in what you say, Ben, because all of what you're saying is accurate. But the biggest problem right now is that our technology... Uh, including things like the Apple Watch and including the ability to monitor vitals on an ongoing basis, the technology is so far out ahead of the information infrastructure to support that, that of the vast majority of that data that you're talking about is never being made into useful or actionable information. And this in and of itself is, is, is you know, four hours worth of your show. Um, it, but it is, it, it's, a major, it's a major concern. Um, you sit down and you talk to a doctor and you say, okay, you know, so here I've got this patient um, who's a diabetic. And, you know, I can continuously monitor um, his, his glucose levels. Or, you know, here's a, a patient I've got with congestive heart failure, and I can continually monitor his blood pressure um, and his weight and so on. But I don't have the bandwidth as a physician to keep track of all of this data from all of my patients. Not even close. Not even, uh, you know, a, a fraction of an inkling Right. Uh, of the ability to do it. And so the real issue to me is is what are we doing with all of this information? I, I just, you know, two weeks ago ran into somebody who has an implantable heart monitor. And, uh, you know, the data is, is um, being generated, but uh, it's not even being monitored on, on an hour by hour, a minute by minute basis. Now, we do know a little bit about how we should be doing this, and one of the theories behind it, now if I get too deep into the woods, please stop me. But one of the things that we talk about is management by exception. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is, you know, a stream of data that is uh, monitored by computer. And when the, 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 the values are outside of normal parameters, then a human being can step in and be notified uh, and intervene. And the, the best example is actually not in medicine. It's in airline reservations, strangely enough. Uh, when you go to make an airline reservation these days, um, how, how many, you know, what's the percentage of, of times that you do it online versus interact with a, a warm human being? Uh, honestly, the last, you know, half dozen times I've flown, it's, I've never really talked to a person. That's right. Neither of most people. So the, the fact is that the only time people really talk to a, a reservations person is when something goes wrong. Or in other words, what they call management by exception. Something that didn't fit within the, the norms of their uh, automated system has occurred, forcing you to talk to a human being. And that's really where we, we need to go with healthcare. We can't rely on our doctors to keep track of this incredible stream of information, nor the insurance companies. But we, we should be able to develop a system so that those of us who do want to get monitored um, have a way of knowing that there's somebody at the other end who, if something goes wrong, will at least be alerted to the fact and then can intervene. And that right. infrastructure, for the most part, except for some health care plans, really doesn't exist today. Uh, and, we, and we're not even anywhere close. 
Right. We we have a very 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 small uh, window into what that might look like with IBM and Watson. They you know they, they recently put in a million health uh, healthcare records from only the New York area, like only I think New York City proper even not even like New York State, but New York City they put in like a million and they use him to diagnose uh, uh, patients. You know saying that okay well. This person has the same symptoms as these 10% of people. These 10% had this disease, you know, and they're able to diagnose something like Watson. That not only management by exception, but also being able to predict that, you know, uh, oh, it's like, hey, you know, this lady over the past two weeks, her blood pressure has been lower and lower and lower. Uh, food intake is lower and lower and lower. Maybe we should look for this, this, and this. It's and you're right, you know, it, that's only like one city let alone an entire country, let alone, you know, an entire world of patients who are going to want, you know, similar kind of healthcare treatment. But that's where machine learning comes into play, and we've been talking about that more and more. Machine so, learning so is ben, the key to that. Yeah, so, so there are a couple of issues here. The first is that what you're talking about with Watson is, is big data. Mm -hmm. um, it is basically uh, saying, you know, if, if this... X hundred thousands of people had these symptoms, then we can we can basically say that if this the the the, hunt, the the next plus one has similar symptoms, we can make a pretty good guess as to what's what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, big data is is really incredibly good for that, and we're going to see more and more of that. And yes, coupled with the, the kind of management exception management by exception that we're talking about for ongoing monitor, those two things are going to be very, very powerful tools f for, for keeping us together. Um, the, the next issue is going to be genomic research, and which is sort of the reverse of big data. Uh, right? It's, ver it, it, it's very personal data. Right, right. So, so then you're basically drafting um, you know, a, a profile of the individual based on, on a very specific set of genes, um, which runs, as I say, exactly the the opposite of, uh, of of big data. Big data draws its conclusions from from an entire you know cohort. Um, you know, your own uh, genome draws it from you. Um, it combined. Uh, it should be uh, a, a terrific way of measuring uh, what is likely to happen to you and what to do about it. That's mm -hmm. great. All right. One of my concerns, and this is this gets a little hairy. You know, those of us who grew up in the in the 1960s and 70s with with George Orwell's 1984 and, <laughs> and the whole concept of Big Brother, you know, had a notion of. <coughs> of Big Brother is, is uh, invading our living rooms. Uh, my concept of Big Brother is evolving to be um, what the government and or insurance companies may be doing in terms of um, this huge thing that we call healthcare costs and health management. And that is that if they have the ability uh, and the willingness to monitor our behavior from birth, can they then basically say, you know, if you don't stop doing this, we're going to cut off your coverage. If we, if you don't, if you don't behave in this manner or that manner, um, are we going to uh, to punish you? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, to me, um, becomes a little scarier. And that, to some extent, is I think the logical extension for some of what we're discussing. So, you know, you can use a lot of this stuff for evil as well as for good. And I, I, I am worried about that. Right. And the there, there is a risk that if you share too much information, which I think has been around since, uh, well, I, I won't go back too far, but uh, share too much information on the Internet, let alone, you know, share too much information with the wrong people. And they'll, you know, there's obviously room for, you know, good things to happen, but uh, definitely room for abuse. So I... I I can see where you're coming from, and you know George Orwell. He's gonna he, he's gonna be around forever at, at this rate with the amount of surveillance that goes on on the internet and big data and yeah. that kind of thing. Uh, the only the, the only constellation we have is that you know 350 400 million people. Hopefully they won't be hopefully they won't be singling people out for eating you know too much pizza. Yeah. Hopefully. 
Yeah, but I, I think they will. I mean, and 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 you know, because uh, there is so much concern now that um, you know, if if you grab somebody at age twenty who could be a diabetic by age fifty, and you basically say you need to start changing your behavior because we can tell you that at age fifty, if you don't change this, you're going to be a diabetic. And what? Where is the? Where do you draw the line, saying uh, that between? Gee, this is you know advice to this is an order. This is basically saying if you don't do it and you become a diabetic, it's not because we didn't warn you and therefore we are not going to pay for you because you were stupid. <laughs> yeah, Craig. <laughs> uh. Did you know that the 1984 was written in 1949? It was right. like 66 years ago. Yeah. Wow. Mm. It was meant to be a post, uh, a an, apoc an apocalyptic future. So, yeah. you know. it fortunately, didn't come to pass. But maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Uh, we gotta take a break here, and uh, when we come back, we're gonna give our social media winner of the week, and then we're gonna let uh, uh, Gary pick uh, the next topic. Because I think we, we've we've covered it pretty much. Um, uh, you're listening to the Computer America Show. Uh, we're going to give away that uh, that uh, Logitech M535 Bluetooth wireless mouse to some lucky person. And we have a news tips bulletin review from uh, Marty Winston coming up as well. It's the last one for this week. Be right back. Hi, this is Craig Crossman, host of the Computer America Show. You have important meetings to schedule. Your company's getting ready for its IPO. And you're in charge of the PTA fundraiser this month. So how do you coordinate everyone to be available at the same time? Are you still using emails, phone calls, even text messages to schedule meetings with a group of people? How's that working out for you? <laughs> Not so great, huh? It's a fact that every day, millions of people suffer from scheduling headaches. Well, with Doodle, scheduling meetings with a group of people is quick and easy. With Doodle, you can easily propose available times to each member. Each one checks off the times that they are available, and then you simply pick the time that works best for the group, all in an easy-to-read display that integrates with your existing calendar. Nothing could be more simple. Give Doodle a try for free, and like millions of Doodle users, you'll truly see how easy it is to find the perfect date and time for all your meetings. That's www.doodle.com. Looking for a best friend? Brother Wolf Animal Rescue has your best friend waiting just for you. The mission of Brother Wolf Animal Rescue is to help build a sustainable, no-kill community where no dogs or cats are ever killed for population control. Where true euthanasia is reserved only for animals who are irremediably suffering or for animals who are truly a threat to society and with no hope of rehabilitation. Brother Wolf staff and volunteers go door to door, neighborhood by neighborhood, to educate citizens about local resources available for at risk pets and to help their families connect with those resources. Brother Wolf's community based approach to no kill helps keep family pets healthy happy and in their homes and out of the local shelter system in the first place. For more information or to make a tax-deductible donation to this wonderful 501c3 organization, visit their website at www.bwar.org. Help to realize Brother Wolf's vision when no animal is euthanized for lack of a home. Who's a good boy? <laughs> Yeah, he sweated so much he made his own waiting pond. Marty Winston with a news tips bulletin review for Computer America. This time, exploring Raspberry Pi. Wiley sent their amazingly comprehensive 700-page Exploring Raspberry Pi Interfacing to the Real World with Embedded Linux by Malloy. We find it <laughs> kind of ironic that the book takes as much space as 16 of those small controllers. But having seen the scope of information that's online, we like that its explanations cover hardware, connections, the OS, applications, and a surprising spectrum of related topics. No, it doesn't answer absolutely everything, but then nothing does. Bottom line, exploring Raspberry Pi is a more than helpful first stop for information and guidance whenever a Raspberry Pi challenge appears. Marty Winston, News Tips Bulletin, for Computer America. 
Yeah. yeah. Welcome back to the Computer America Show. And yeah, like Craig said, uh, yeah, we are here in the, in the last half hour on Friday. My goodness, it's uh, mm. the week. The weekend is almost upon us as we uh, finish up here. And uh, Craig, before we get to the social media winner of the week, I just gotta say that uh, you know Gary K joining us for both hours graciously. And to go, please check out Tech Fifty Plus. A lot of great articles, and you know, uh, and there are certainly a lot of them that change. You know, very very frequently. Like I've I've never had Gary on twice and seen the same article up on the homepage. So obviously worth checking out very very occasionally. Right. But I will say, this one here is solar worth it if you are over fifty. Um, wow, how morbidly practical of an article. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Um, uh, yeah, that's all I got. So, uh, social media winner. Right. Now, again, it's Tech50 Plus. You can spell it out P L U S, tech50plus.com, or you can head over to our website, computeramerica.com. Right there on our homepage, we have a link to the Tech50 Plus website as well. Uh, so you can check that out. But yes, you, you're correct, and it's time for our social media winner of the week. So, let's gear it up. This week's social media winner is. Len Massey. Len Massey, congratulations. You're our social media winner of the week. He wins the Logitech M535 Bluetooth wireless mouse. It works with Windows, works with Mac, with Chrome OS, Android. Basically, it works just about everything. Uh, it works on various surfaces, from metal cafe tables to tile countertops to your favorite wood desk, thanks to its laser-grade optical sensor. Uh, it gives you the Bluetooth mouse, gives you the freedom to create anything, anytime, anywhere on the computer that you choose, all in comfort. Valued at forty dollars. Congrats, Len. Actually, we have a comment. He actually left a a comment this time. Uh, Len, by the way, listens to us in Fairmount, Indiana. Okay, and he said, "I really need a new mouse, and this one has all the bells and whistles." So there you go. So yes, Len, congratulations. You're our winner this week, and you get that beautiful mouse. And again, head over to ComputerAmerica.com. Just go to our Interact pull-down menu on any page there. It says Social Media uh, Contests. Interact with them and just uh, fill it out. Um, just go to all the different places that Computer America um, uh, interacts with on the social media. There's Blue, there's a, a Google+, Plus. there's Facebook, there's uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel. Just like or subscribe to any of them. Each one counts as a, an entry. Uh, for the week, so you can have up to five entries every single week when you do that. And who knows, we might be calling out your name next week. Okay? All right, so uh, we continue on with Gary Kay, and this is the last half hour of the show. Again, Ben mentioned that uh, there will be no live show um, on Monday. It is the 4th of July weekend, the 4th of July holiday, 4th of July on a Monday. But we will be back Tuesday and uh, live. So in the meantime... Uh, Gary, um, which t you know we've got uh, so many topics, so little time to, to choose. So, the, what I'd like to talk about is uh, some of the progress that's going on with wearables, and and how we sort of need to redefine our view of of what a wearable is. Okay. Um, you know, we sort of started off with the notion of of these uh, activity trackers that are on our wrists. Um, and the, sadly, more than uh, according to a, a recent study by uh, by Phillips, uh, actually it's sort of the Institute for Future Living or something like that. Um, three quarters of them wind up in a in a drawer after uh, less than six months. Yeah. Um, and and that's sort of sort of sad. But the next generations of wearables are going to go from things that do the you know what we've talked about is the quantified self, keeping track of your steps or your sleep, um, and they're going to move towards uh, really generating useful information and not just um, sort of data that you share with with your own smartphone and nothing else. Um, you know, diagnostics that will tell um, your caregiver uh, or or a doctor if your doctor has the capability of of monitoring stuff, as we talked about a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like your blood oxygen level, blood glucose, um, your weight on an ongoing basis, 
uh, and, and so on. So, so we're getting into the diagnostics. Uh, we now have uh, implantable hot heart monitors that can be uh, put into the muscle of the heart and that are the size of a paper clip uh, and, and done with uh, essentially a, a minimally invasive process. Um, and, and then from, uh, from there we're moving into uh, wearables as, as therapeutics you know, things that actually um, will assist you. Um, in some cases, it may be a fabric that acts as a, as a compression device. Um, in, uh, you know, it, won't, it wouldn't be a surprise to me if uh, in the not too distant future, uh, we're going to get fabrics that will take a lot of the elements of an exoskeleton. Uh, and put them right into the fabric where you'll be able to essentially contract the fabric the way you would contract muscles and and help you lift things. Hmm. Um, and th there's some pretty exciting research being done there. Um, you know, and again, on the sensor side now, not only do you have uh, sensors that will, uh, you know, help you um, you know, keep track of your heart rate, but like a company called Sensoria does sensors that go into socks. Well, for runners, these are terrific because they can show a runner uh, exactly where he's landing on his feet, and if he needs to change the way uh, the way he's running uh, for a better stride or to take pressure off of his foot. But those same uh, measures can be used to uh, to ward off uh, diabetic foot problems because uh, they can measure uh, pressure points. More than that is there are new algorithms out there that will let uh, sensors um, essentially predict whether or not you're likely to take a fall. Uh, and falls, as you as you know, are very, very expensive, costing tens of thousands of dollars on average. Um, and uh, these things have been shown to be uh, eighty percent or better effective in predicting uh, the likelihood of a fall. Uh, so there's there's a lot of exciting stuff that's that's taking place with wearables. And then of course we start getting into the sort of body parts thing, um, where you go from uh, you know actual you know, using 3D printing and, and uh, other technologies. There's a company in Brooklyn called Epibone that will use your own stem cells and grow pieces of bone for you that can really? be used, yeah, um, is uh, in, in replacement parts for ankles and knees and wrists and so on, uh, which is pretty exciting stuff. They use 3D printing and uh, and your own cells. What's really scary is they're actually making jewelry out of this stuff. That creeps me out a little bit. You know, it's like, oh, grow your own bone jewelry. Uh, maybe not. Um, you know, they they actually have artists on staff who are designing bone jewelry. It, that, that's like in the same vein to me as the people who will, uh, you know, cremating your ashes. It's uh, or I'm sorry, cremating your remains to get ashes. That's pretty common. But then they'll send it off to a lab. And they'll uh, crush it into coffee a mug out of it. Crush it into a diamond. Yeah. And put it into jewelry. So and then like and then you're wearing around someone's remains. That, that, see that's also creepy to me. But um, yeah, no, that would, that would be pretty. That would be creepy, creepy to me as well. Yeah. Um, but you know what's interesting is uh, you know so for example, um, one of the you know, we've been able to come up with with artificial heart valves, and we've been able to, to use transplants. But as you know, uh, when it comes to a pancreas or a liver or or a kidney, uh, there are still uh, in, inherent problems in transplants. The biggest one being rejection. And obviously, um, you know, one day we'll be able to essentially print three D print our own body parts. Our own replacement parts. Need a new kidney? Oh, have some of my stem cells. We'll build it on a matrix and plop it in. No, re no rejection. It's yep. my kidney, my heart, um, my pancreas, and so on. Uh, the frustrating thing to me is that I'm not going to live to see most of this because it's probably, um, even though they're doing things like you know noses and and bones and cartilage uh, already. Um, 
the really specialized uh, cell structures, the, the livers, the kidneys, and so on, probably won't be doable in a lab for about another um, 20, 30 years. Yeah, it, it's, it's going to be pretty far out there, but when they do get it down, it's, uh, it's going to be really, really cool. And, um, but one thing that we didn't cover on the show when it happened, this just happened a couple weeks ago, if I remember correctly, it was a gentleman lived for, like, it was like a year and a half or a full year, whatever it was. He had a backpack that wasn't really a backpack. It held a mechanical heart, and he was strapped to it, and he had to keep it with him 24-7, obviously, because it's his heart. But he didn't have a heart in his chest. He was waiting for a transplant, and this was, you know, the stopgap measure. And so, you know, to keep him from being strapped to a bed for a year while he was waiting for a transplant, he had it in a backpack that, you know, he was able to walk around, ride a bike, do all his normal stuff. Uh, but his, you know, he had no heart in his chest, just the pump in his backpack. I remember that. That was, that was so that, weird. That was a temporary solution, I think, though, while he was waiting for a heart. But right. no, he wasn't hook, hooked. He didn't have to be uh, anchored to a heart-lung machine like you know. T that used no, but, to but these have been you know, the, these uh, devices have generally been used to assist hearts. Uh, like was what was it, the Jarvik Seven? Yes, I remember. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and those have been around now for almost for a, a generation. The 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 outside assist devices, um, you know, and there are uh, under development there are artificial kidneys that you'll be able to strap on. Uh, one is being developed uh, up at the University of Washington. Uh, you know, obviously not nearly as good as being able to replace your own organ. Kidneys are really proving tough to to figure out too is a very complex organ for a little tiny thing. Yeah, or it's just a series of tubes. Yeah, and all the filtering of the blood. You think it'd be really simple. You know, just put a little uh, charcoal filter, and you. No. Yeah, no, and, and in fact, they're they're trying. There's a, a project underway, that's a, a joint effort at Vanderbilt University and uh, the University of California in San Francisco, to develop an implantable uh, artificial kidney, um, using nano filter technology and the biggest issue is so far has been um, uh, blood clotting because anytime you know the blood is really peculiar as soon as it hits a foreign object it wants to clot up um, and uh, they still have not quite been able to resolve that uh, they've there have been um, external kidney devices um, under development for actually almost 30 years going back to UCLA in the 1980s um, and they've just had, pardon me, a bitch of a time getting it right. Mm. Have they gotten it right? Will the external devices now work? Um, they've they've reached the point where one of them was uh, being tested on dogs. Uh, none of them have yet has had uh, uh, FDA approval. I think the, there was a there's a project underway at. Uh, a University of Washington that's been fast-tracked by the FDA that is showing some promise, which is a strap-on device. Because yeah, the alternative is just dialysis. You have to go to dialysis every every day. Uh, you have to go. There are there are two different forms of dialysis. Uh, one is called hemodialysis, and that's what you're talking about, where you have to go to a center, on average, three times a week, and they, you know. They hook you, hook up your blood vessels, and filter out your blood. And the other uh, is called peritoneal dialysis. Uh, and you actually can do that at home overnight, uh, and uh, it drains fluids uh, in your uh, abdominal cavity, uh, and uh, simply uses osmosis to get the bad stuff out. Neither of these is really a terrific thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it keeps you alive, but but it ain't any fun. And it, it sort of, you know, um, with with, with uh, peritoneal dialysis, you can still travel because you can uh, sort of get the chemicals lined up wherever you're traveling to. But it's, you really can't be spontaneous. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you, know, you would think that they would it would it would have uh, moved more quickly given the the advancements of of technology and. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, the, the funny, it's, it's sort of strange because now that, uh, you know, you look at back at the last oh, 30, 40 years, um, and I, I, actually I take it back to sort of the space shot and 
many of us have come to believe that that we can accomplish anything with technology, uh, and we've accomplished so much. But at the same time, now that we see, you know, what we can do with technology, it's very frustrating that we haven't resolved all of these issues, like kidneys, like cancer, um, you know, all of these things. Why can't why haven't we solved that yet? Uh, and I think that that. Uh, you know, it's it's obviously a two-sided issue here. One is, yeah, we've made tremendous progress, but no, the more progress that we make, the more frustrating it is that we haven't gotten all the way on on matters of A, B, C, D, and, and X, Y, Z. Yeah, exactly. I thought they would have solved the uh, the aging process by now. We just get to live forever. But... Yeah, oh I'm no. Not sure. The, the, they have that nail. It's just Craig. As soon as as soon as you're dead, the <laughs> next day they're gonna say, "All right, folks, we can bring it out now. We're kidding. Everyone's good. Everyone's good." <laughs> I think we missed it. Like about if we had been born another, you know, 50, 25 or 30 years or 40 years earlier, that we it, it might be a, a, a attainable at, in that person's life. I think maybe in Ben's lifetime, uh, before he. You mean 25, 30 years later? Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. If it had been born 25, 30 years years later. We would have gotten. I think of, of all the times we could have been born through the the history of humankind, you know, and all the thousands and thousands of years, where all of a sudden we're almost there, and uh, and we may just have missed the boat. But Ben may might make it, or maybe his kids. Worst case scenario, will make it. No, I I absolutely agree with you, Craig. I think that um, you know we're right now we're looking at at uh, longevity figures of you know. 80 years and 70 plus years, mm -hmm. that 25 years from now, um, middle class Americans will look forward to longevity of, of 100 years easy. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and with a reasonable quality of life. Right. You just remind me of a joke, and I promise it's not, uh, <laughs> it's not offensive to any religion, and if you take it that way, then too bad for you. But, um, okay, so the joke goes, uh, there's a couple vacationing in Jerusalem. They're walking around, seeing the sights, what have you. All of a sudden, the wife uh, gets a heart attack, and she dies. And so, you know, the guy's there. He's making arrangements, and you know, and, and a rabbi comes up and says, you know, for uh, for a hundred dollars, we can bury we can bury her here, or for a hundred thousand dollars, we can ship her back, you know, to to the U.S. and have her buried at your home. And he's like, and he thinks about it for a moment, and he says, just send her back home for a hundred thousand dollars says, why would you do that? For $100, she could be buried in, in, you know, in, in the Holy Land. And he said, well, I heard about a gentleman uh, about 2,000 years ago that uh, they did that, and three days later, he came back to life, and I just can't take that chance. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. will be here oh, all week. <laughs> here all week, huh, Ben? Uh, <laughs> Thank goodness it's Friday, right, folks? <laughs> So is there anything else you guys want to touch on before we wrap up the two hours? Yeah, throw exactly. It, throw it back to you. No, yeah, what about uh, um, Apple missing the boat in VR? I'm this is sort of interesting. You know, uh, our, our friend and, and contributor Tim Beharan is, is considered one of the leading uh, analysts who, who uh, follows uh, and, and works with Apple. And, uh, and Tim's take on this is that... Uh, um, Apple's just going to sort of bide its time that VR is not yet at a point where it's mass market. And, uh, and Apple has a long tradition of, of not necessarily being on the cutting edge, but on uh, taking technology uh, and making it the best it can be once the mass market is ready for it. And uh, Tim's take is that... Uh, you know today's VR systems, um, you know, like like Samsung's um, VR, mm -hmm. uh, are essentially low quality tethered devices that will never catch on for the mass market. And he says that when Apple gets around to doing it, uh, it'll be a high quality device that will not be tethered to anything. Um, it'll be standalone. It'll have high power graphics. Uh, it'll be you know super terrific, and the price will be down there so that um, it is affordable and, and you know they can sell millions of units a month. And he, Tim says he doesn't see that happening anytime within the next year or two. 
Really? No, not like everything he just described, where you know it has to be all in one and it has to be portable and it has to be, uh, you know, good to a certain extent. Uh, the closest we have is a smartphone that you strap into a headset, and you know, and that's still a a that's still pretty close cool. from an HTC Vive or, or an Oculus Rift. Hmm. Yeah. So I I think that's uh, you know if if you're waiting for Apple VR. Um, you know. No, we're still waiting for Apple TV. <laughs> you know, just, Apple no, did no. say they might be getting into the car industry, so that's something. Yeah, or an Apple car. I mean, exactly. I mean, well, how, Elon Musk has said he he sees Apple as a potential competitor. Yeah, well, and that's saying something. Well, that's because Apple snapped up a bunch of uh, of ex Tesla members or uh, you know kind of founding members that. Yeah, Apple hired a bunch of car engineers for some reason, and the only reason one could assume is because, hey, Apple might be making a self-driving car. Um, you know, I, I, it's really interesting to see how the players are lining up. I, Google, I guess, has done a deal with Ford mm-hmm. for, for some prototypes. Um, I don't think that Google particularly wants to be in the automotive manufacturing business as much as they want to be in the uh, the technology business. Um but I think you know, uh, uh, you know, if if you're Tim Cook and you are looking, pardon the expression, down the road, um, and you know, you look at the whole notion of cars as being part of a connected ecosystem um, instead of of just this thing with four wheels, uh, then it becomes uh, a, you know a, a reasonable target f- for Apple to look at. I mean, the notion. That a lot of people have today is that is that cars are not much more than computers on wheels. Mm. Yeah, that's a good notion to have because it's true. Yeah, exactly. New new cars are coming off the line with uh, with cell phone plans because they need data. Yeah, I mean cars are becoming uh, compu- They are computers on wheels now. They have been for some time and just 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 uh, extending this. Um, and we're going to be seeing the first V to V, you know, vehicle to vehicle communications protocols being endorsed by the federal government. Uh, I think the the rulemaking um, the proposals are due this summer, so it's it's not going to be all that far afterwards that we uh, before we see some some prototypes. Mm. Uh, listen, uh, uh, Gary, I know we only have like about. Four minutes left. So, do you think you can wrap up net neutrality? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think no. the, the the bottom line on on net neutrality is that it's a throwback to the common carrier notions of of a, a bygone era when uh, communications was was controlled by AT and T. Period. You know, Ma Bell had every had a stranglehold on everything, and um, the Federal Communications Commission stepped in and said, "No, you can't do that. If if people people are going to have the right to connect to your network, um, and you can have the right, you'll have the right to charge them for that, but you can't control what's being connected to the network other than making sure that it doesn't blow up your network." And I think that taking that same notion um, to the internet was really a, a wonderful thing for the FCC to do. Uh, it basically means that now uh, all players have equal access to that pipeline, so that you at you know Computer America can put your stuff out there. I at Tech Fifty Plus can put my stuff out there, and I don't have to worry about competing with Comcast. Um, okay. In in terms of of having to pay more money not to have my data stream throttled back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, and and then there's another six hours of net neutrality we haven't covered. So you know. <laughs> well, I mean, it's 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 a fascinating topic. Uh, it it also has tremendous implications for my audience, uh, and this whole area that we talked about about social isolation, <laughs> and how you can connect up. An older audience, especially one that's that's housebound, and the importance 
uh, the, the ever-increasing importance of the internet to their very survival, to find information, to stay connected with healthcare providers, with their relatives, with their friends. Oh, it's, it's just, you know, yeah. had, had the, uh, the district court not upheld net neutrality, I think it would have been a real blow. Well, listen, as I said, we're just pretty much out of time. Again, uh, you, uh, head over to uh, tech50plus.com and uh, register uh, and uh, check out the, the, the publications there. Uh, certainly worthwhile uh, reading many articles of interest. Uh, Gary, I want to thank you for being here with us. Uh, Always fun. And have a great, happy 4th of July uh, holiday. And uh, stay with us. 90 seconds. Stay with us to the end, Gary. Okay? Uh, we're going to... Come up uh, over the as again over the Fourth of July weekend's upon us. We're going to have a, a no live show on Monday, and then we're going to be back with Epson. We're going to be talking about their new Echo Tank series of printers, where they have enough ink one time with regular printing to have ink for two years. Without talk about a tankless job. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Two years without having to buy ink for your. And you're still going to run out of magenta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I've got one of them, and I love it. I absolutely adore it. It's absolutely amazing. We're going to have them on the show talking about that uh, in the first hour. And then the second hour, Computer and Technology News, brought to you by Slimware Utilities, the official optimization software of Computer America. Have a great Fourth of July weekend, you know. We're going to have two brand-new uh, news tech bulletins from Marty Winston uh, next week for you as well. It's just going to be a fun week. So, you know... Crack open the uh, the hot dogs, the hamburgers, and just have a very festive weekend. And Ben and I will see you here, same time, same place, on Tuesday. So until Tuesday afternoon, this is Craig Crossman hoping that your hard disk never becomes floppy. Have a great weekend. Bye, everyone. Woohoo! Ten seconds. Thank you for using Blog Talk Radio. Goodbye. Okay, again, everybody, thank you so much for watching, and again, a great holiday weekend, 4th of July weekend. Gary, thanks again for being with us. Always a pleasure. It was a lot of fun. And uh, we'll uh, see you next month, okay? Very fine. Look All forward right. to it, Craig. All right, take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.